Thank you, Gil, and thank you to the organizers for having me here. Um, I wish I could do half a good uh, as a job as Mike did because I'll not be giving you my vision. I'll be giving you the data that we have. Um, all right, so we'll talk about some of the approved biologics, specifically focusing on some of the newer medications in the last five years, and then we'll go over some of the emerging therapies, and I'll try to tie all these things together a little bit. Um, and then with the emerging therapies, I would also like to bring to your attention some of the work that is being done on perianal Crohn's disease and some uh, improvements there. So this is a paradigm of what is approved to date. Very interesting to see uh, that up until five years ago, we were relying on one class of one mechanism of action, which was anti-TNF agents. And already in the last five years, we've had two different agents uh, from a Crohn's disease standpoint, which work different from each other uh, being approved and more so for ulcerative colitis. And this is what we anticipate will happen in the next three to five years in terms of FDA approval of medications. Some of these medications are in advanced stages of phase three trials. Uh, the obligatory figure, which tells us about which are, which are the medications that are approved and how they basically work. We have the anti-TNF agents, uh, three of them are used and approved for Crohn's disease, infliximab, adalumumab, and sertilizumab pegol. Then we have the trafficking inhibitors, natalizumab and vedalizumab being approved for, uh, for Crohn's disease. And finally, ustekinumab, which is an IL-1223 antagonist approved for Crohn's disease. Let me talk about virolizumab, an agent that was approved about five years ago now, as a gut-selective anti-integrin. This was designed as an improvement over natalizumab due to concerns for uh, potentially fatal side effects uh, with natalizumab related to progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. By virtue of being more gut-selective, uh, the thought was that it will be a safer medication the clinical trials related to verolizumab at week six demonstrated that it's superior to placebo, although the magnitude of difference, um, as you'll see here, is not as impressive. This theme will bear with any of the new medications that you see. And again, this is induction of remission data at week eight. If you look at maintenance of remission, and again, all of these trials are designed as a re-randomization of responders. So people who improve with therapy, uh, with induction therapy, are then re-randomized to either going back to placebo, or if they responded to placebo to continue on the same, or they go to vedolizumab every eight weeks or every four weeks. And as we can see consistently over 54 weeks, vedolizumab was superior to uh, placebo for clinical endpoints. Note, there are no endoscopic endpoints reported here. And that has been a limitation of, of some of the existing Crohn's disease trials. They've largely relied on clinical endpoints, which we now recognize are not as reliable, definitely from a Crohn's disease standpoint. This was the point that uh, Gil alluded to earlier. Almost all our medications work well if we use them first line. That probably also holds true for infliximab or adalumumab. They never got a chance to be studied as a second line agent, which is to their advantage. But if you look at the TNF antagonist failure population versus TNF naive population, we clearly see a larger delta when it comes to vedolizumab in the naive population. Again, keep in mind these studies were not powered to necessarily look at the efficacy of vedolizumab in the failure population, so I wouldn't necessarily make too much of the subgroup analysis and the complete lack of efficacy from this figure. We need to keep things in mind uh, when we are treating our patients. These are some tools that can be helpful. So this was a clinical prediction tool uh, uh, that was built by one of my colleagues at UC San Diego using data from the Gemini clinical trials and subsequently validating it both in a real world data set as well as in clinical trials. And what this basically suggests is the, the bars on green are the people who have the highest probability of responding to vedolizumab. The bars in red are the people who have the lowest probability of responding to vedolizumab. So who are the people most likely to respond to vedolizumab? These are my TNF naive patients who have not had a prior bowel surgery no prior fistulizing disease, have a good baseline albumin, and a low C-reactive protein. This is my moderate Crohn's disease patient who's doing reasonably well from a symptomatic and in a burden of inflammation standpoint. Uh, 
the people who are least likely to respond are the complete opposite of this, which unfortunately tends to be how we uptake new medications, I, as, as Mike mentioned. There's a warehousing effect. We keep all our refractory patients for the new medication that is coming around, and that may not be the best impression that we get of the drug at that point. So keep that in mind when we are thinking about some of these newer agents. Uh, Long-term safety of verilizumab, that, was, that, that is proposed to be an advantage because by itself the medication is gut selective. Uh, the main side effects that were observed in the initial trials and subsequently in uh, long-term open-label extension studies, roughly about a 10% rate of nasopharyngitis um, across ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Uh, keep in mind there's no placebo arm that we are seeing here, so we don't know what the rates were in the placebo group. And if you look at adverse events of special interest, uh, rates of serious infections were roughly about six to se uh, six to ten percent, and rates of malignancy were about six to seven percent. Not to say that these are malignancies due to uh, uh, verilizumab, but this was the rate that was ob observed across all of these trials. We will talk a little bit more about this. Uh, we, in my viewpoint, you should. Uh, while the safety of a particular medication is important, we need to think about safety from a treatment approach standpoint. If you're gonna be using a medication which needs a lot of corticosteroids with it, or if you use a medication that invariably involves the use of azathioprine, some of the safety advantages that may be specific to a biologic agent may dissipate. Uh, moving on to ustekinumab, which is an IL-1223 antagonist, kind of a cytokine inhibitor, in my naive mind, cytokine inhibitors are things like TNF and ustekinumab trafficking inhibitors sort of keep from fueling a fire. They don't necessarily work to kill off the existing fire. Uh, two pivotal induction studies, one in naive patients, one in uh, failure patients. The drug was effective in both naive and failure patients, although the magnitude of benefit, as you see, again, is higher in the naive patient population. If we start looking at how quickly changes start to happen, these are C-reactive protein or calprotectin changes, um, and what we start to see is typically by week three, they start to differentiate from uh, placebo in terms of biochemical responses. We do not have any earlier endpoints, so it's hard to say whether or not the changes are happening earlier. This is the maintenance data, and this will address one of the questions that Gil pre presented earlier, and I made a note. Um, so if you look at the maintenance uh, medications, it was both used to kinemab every eight weeks as well as every 12 weeks. Both of these doses were effective for achieving an endpoint of clinical remission, clinical response, and I think the question was related to glucocorticoid uh, steroid-free remission, and both of these medications were effective. That said, the FDA has approved a 90 milligram every eight-week dose, uh, and that is the dose that I use in my clinical practice. Uh, I, I'm going to defy uh, what you've been told earlier. I'm just going to put all of these medications next to each other. Bear in mind, I only looked at the biologic naive patient population. Um, so they are somewhat comparable in terms of one of the biggest predictors of lack of response, which is exposure to a previous biologic. Um, if you look at the Infliximab trials, I'll be a little wary of them. We, they're not that impressive. Uh, the initial trial in 1997 was a single dose of infliximab, and you never achieve a 30 percent, five milligrams per kilogram dose within two weeks. Um, and likewise, the Limon trial was a combination infliximab plus azathioprine versus azathioprine alone uh, trial. And again, the rates were a rather too impressive. Um, but across, if we look at some of the other anti-TNF agents, we see adalimumab and sertralizumab pegol with a delta of around. Um, 15% for adalimumab. And if we put the newer medications, specifically the anti-TNF naive patient population, roughly a 10 to 20% delta across both of these medications. So I'm going to use data from the network meta-analysis that were uh, presented and put them in context. If we look across all of these trials, the placebo rates of induction of remission is roughly around 15% and the maintenance of clinical remission is roughly around 20%. Using the odds ratios from those, we anticipate that roughly 50% of infliximab treated patients would have induction of remission, and roughly 40% would have, 45% would have maintenance of remission. 
And similarly for adalumumab, 40% for induction of remission, maintenance of remission, and about 60%. The other medications from a first-line agent have lower rates of achieving remission. That said, even with these network meta-analyses, all of these presented, everything that was presented was against placebo. If you start looking at indirect comparisons between different active agents, there was no statistical significance or statistical superiority of any one agent over another, which is a limitation of all of these uh, network meta-analyses when you do not have any head-to-head -head trials. Um, Gil alluded to this, we anticipate several head-to-head -head trials which will inform how we practice. There are trials of ustukinumab versus adalumumab, which are anticipated to be completing sometime next year. There's a trial of a newer um, IL-23 antagonist versus adalumumab, and of course the um, trial of uh, standard versus high-dose adalumumab, all of which we expect would inform how we practice. Moving on to some of the emerging therapies for Crohn's disease, Mike made my job easier by going over some of the mechanism of action. Almost everything that's being tried in UC is also being tried in Crohn's disease. Uh, first, we'll talk about some of the cytokine receptor antagonists, so interleukin and JAK inhibitor-based therapies. Uh, here, one consistent theme that you will see across trials of most new agents in Crohn's disease, the induction of remission endpoints are being studied later and later. So most of these trials now have induction of remission being studied between week 10 to week 16, as opposed to adalumumab, which was week four, or vedolizumab, which was week six. Um, so keep that in mind. We've realized that these medications do not work, may not work as quickly. Part of the reason is, again, most of these newer trials have upwards of 50 to 70% of people who are TNF exposed. Some of these trials have actually 100% of people who are TNF exposed, and most of our medications do not work as effective, like I said, in the TNF exposed patient population. They're somewhat slower acting in that patient population. Um, so resencizumab is a selective IL-23 inhibitor, phase two induction study, 121 patients, again, 93% anti-TNF exposed at week 12, impressive data uh, in a failure population, a 20-point difference in rates of clinical remission by week 12 at the highest dose. All of these trials have also started moving into more objective endpoints like endoscopic remission and mucosal healing, and here again is 17-point difference between the highest dose versus placebo. Uh, phase two studies invariably tend to overestimate the efficacy of a medication, uh, so uh, keep that in mind and wait for the fa full phase three uh, trials. Uh, Brazicumab is again another selective IL-23 inhibitor which uh, demonstrated, uh, didn't demonstrate statistically significant rates of clinical remission or response by week 12 over placebo, but if you look at a modified endpoint which was a clinical response plus a 50% decline in baseline calprotectin and C-reactive protein, a significant difference, attesting to the fact that there is definitely clearly a signal that this medication may be effective in controlling inflammation and is being pursued for phase three studies. Moving on to some of the uh, JAK inhibitors, we talked about tofacitinib as, as a medication that inhibits JAK1, 2, and 3. Some of the newer medications are more selective JAK1 inhibitors, still others are inhibiting both JAK1 and JAK3, um, which may have differential effects on patients, may have differential effects on the safety profile of these, page, of these medications. So uh, what about tofacitinib for Crohn's disease? It's a medication that is approved and works really well for ulcerative colitis, but does it work for Crohn's disease? Uh, this is data from phase 2b studies in Crohn's disease, uh, basically demonstrating that there is no clear difference in rates of clinical remission. Uh, between placebo and tofacitinib at either of the two doses. Important things to keep in mind is there were high placebo rates, 40% placebo rates in these trials, which was a limitation. Um, these studies would subsequently be underpowered if you have such a high placebo rate because that's not what you think about when you're designing the trial. There was no fixed CRP or fecal calprotectin threshold, although the trials did enroll patients with visible ulceration at trial entry. Uh, objectively speaking, there was a, significant, a greater decline in C-reactive protein in the tofacitinib treated patients. This medication is not being pursued in a phase three study for Crohn's disease, but it lent enough 
proof or con proof of concept that this class of medications may be effective in a well-designed trial for, as we treat Crohn's disease. And this led to subsequent trials of uh, selective JAK1 inhibitors. Phil Gottenib uh, for Crohn's disease, again, a phase two study, 174 patients, looking at outcomes at week 10. Um, more than half of the patients were TNF exposed. And here again, by week 10, we see upwards of 25% delta in rates of achieving clinical remission. And like Mike alluded, these are fast-acting medications. We are seeing differences between uh, placebo and active medication by week two uh, when it comes to some of these endpoints. Um, Upadacitinib um, is another uh, selective JAK1 inhibitor from uh, AbV. Phase two induction trial, 180 patients, almost all of them were anti-TNF exposed. Now looking at outcomes at week 16. And here, uh, rates of uh, clinical remission at the higher dose, clinical response, as well as endoscopic remission were significantly higher with the active medication than with placebo. Again, with the use of centralized reading, we are getting placebo rates that are significantly lower. Historically, we've been used to placebo rates of about 25 to 30% for clinical endpoints. Now with objective endpoints and centralized reading for endoscopy, we are seeing median placebo rates of about um, zero to 10%. Uh, the, the next class of medications that, is, uh, that we have verorizumab for right now is a leukocyte, uh, leukocyte trafficking inhibitors. There are some of these also being pursued for treatment of Crohn's disease. Um, etrolizumab is probably the one that is the mo at the most advanced stage of development. Phase three induction trials now presented almost a year ago. 300 patients, uh, uh, three-fourths of them being exposed to anti-TNF agents, looking at week 14 endpoints. Uh, a, a roughly a 12-point difference in rates of achieving clinical remission and significant differences in endoscopic improvement. Um, abrilumab is uh, also being pursued for Crohn's disease. This is a phase 2B induction trial, roughly 80% anti-TNF exposed patients looking at week 12 outcomes, some suggestion of difference in clinical remission and clinical response even, um, uh, even for this medication. Uh, moving on to Ozanimod, I, I, I group them with a trafficking inhibitor because in my mind, conceptually, it's going to be closer to, uh, even though it's blocking exit from lymph nodes, in concept, it's probably closer to a trafficking inhibitor rather than a cytokine antagonist. Uh, the Ozanimod trial was a phase two single arm study, uh, so there's no placebo arm. And when they looked at all patients with centralized reading uh, using a validated endoscopic index, we are seeing roughly about 25% rates of achieving a 50% reduction from baseline and roughly a 60, uh, roughly a 50% rates of achieving remission. And they anchored it roughly thinking that placebo rates are probability grown of about 20 to 30%. And so it is being pursued further in, uh, as a phase three study within Crohn's disease. Uh, finally, the uh, the, the medication that everybody was looking forward to, this was Mongerson, a SMAD7 antisense uh, oligonucleotide. Uh, too good to be true. A medication given for two weeks, uh, giving us deltas of over 40% by four weeks, which is two weeks of an oral medication. Uh, uh, no wonder the phase three trial was negative and stopped due to fertility. Further development of this medication for Crohn's disease has been suspended and it is not being pursued. Uh, finally, something for our most challenging patients, people with refractory perianal disease. Uh, the ex exciting times with availability of mesenchymal stem cell injections. This was a phase three placebo control study in Europe, looking at 212 patients with actively draining complex perianal fistula, but with minimally active luminal disease. Something to keep in mind as you interpret and apply this to your patients as and when the drug comes to market. Um, looking at week 24 endpoints uh, with a pretty rigorous uh, endpoint, closure of all external, all draining external openings and no collection of more than two centimeters on an MRI. Uh, we're seeing a 15 point uh, difference, roughly 50% of patients achieving that uh, clinical endpoint by week 24 with an intralesional injection of this adipose derived mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, in the meantime, people have been looking at autologous adipose tissue, even our surgeons do it. Um, and this was a proof of concept single arm study, wherein autologous adipose tissue from patients was derived uh, and spun down and subsequently injected in 21 patients with Crohn's disease. 
um, roughly 70% uh, of these patients needed repeated uh, needed two or three repeat injections. Uh, but at the end of six months, uh, roughly 57% of patients achieved fistula healing, uh, complete uh, cessation of secretion of about 14% in an additional 14% of patients. Uh, some complications, uh, but most of them were pretty mild. So everybody's excited about uh, looking at uh, intralesional injection of mesenchymal stem cells for a complex perianal uh, Crohn's disease uh, patient. So in summary, uh, anti-TNF agents in my view are probably the most effective first-line agents for Crohn's disease. Here I'm specifically referring to infliximab and adalumumab. Uh, I, I, I didn't show you the data, but this is also available in the network meta-analysis. In my mind, a used to kind of may be the most effective second-line agent for Crohn's disease, especially in patients who were primary non-responders to anti-TNF agents. In my practice, if, if somebody was a primary responder to infliximab, developed immunogenicity, and much more likely to switch them to adalumumab rather than go out of class. Uh, and finally, there are some exciting times, selective interleukin inhibitors looking at... Uh, uh, selective IL-23 inhibitors there, uh, selective JAK inhibitors and leukocyte trafficking agents, which are in advanced stages of development, and intralesional injection of adiposed-derived mesenchymal stem cells is an exciting option for our refractory perianal fistula patients if we're able to achieve luminal uh, control. Uh, there is limited data on comparative efficacy and safety of different medications, and this is something that we anticipate the uh, ongoing head-to-head -head trials will inform, and this will directly inform our practice. Thank you again.